shorebirds as a group are uh, showing pretty alarming declines. We know through Canada's State of the Birds reports uh, in 2012 that shorebirds have declined by almost half uh, since the 1970s. So that really sends off alarm bells to us and in particular for the semi-palmated sandpiper which is also showing declines. I remember very well seeing my first uh, group of roosting sandpipers at Evangeline Beach in uh, Nova Scotia off Wolfville. I think there was a group of about 5,000 birds and I was quite captivated by this beautiful sight of this roost of, of small birds resting on the beach and uh, I found this so fascinating that I started asking what I thought were the logical questions. Uh, could somebody tell me where are these birds from? Uh, but most important, what are they doing here? How long are they here and where are they going? To make a long story short, I enrolled into a master's program in which I looked at the uh, migration and feeding ecology of semi permanent sandpipers in the Bay of Fundy. And out of that, we got the very first uh, chronology of migration, but also the, the, the sudden appearance of very large numbers, their quick decline, so birds were here for a short time, but seeing groups of 100,000 suddenly became quite common. They followed the tide down, that was quite obvious, and then I went to where birds were picking at the ground and picking at the mud, and then when I took my, my sample uh, and sieved it through uh, with water, I found these thousands of little shrimp, mud shrimp as, as we were called. And then I found out that they're Corophium volutator, a species. What was interesting was that Corophium was more abundant on some mud flats than others. And consequently, when you looked at where the mud birds fed, they fed where Corophium was most abundant. We embarked on a banding program and we started uh, the banding right here on, on this beach. We had to invent a way to catch the birds without harming them, so we invented a trap called the Fundy Pull Trap. When the birds would come here and rest, the idea was how to bring a, a net uh, over the birds and hold them there until we could collect them, weigh them, band them, and release them again. And uh, what we found is the very first ones we marked uh, were discovered in Suriname and South America. So we knew that when a relatively short time, the birds could fly from here, and we assume directly to Suriname. Well, the Bay of Fundy is one of the most important sites for the semi-palmated sandpiper because it helps connect their Arctic breeding grounds to their uh, South American wintering grounds. And it's right in the middle of that Atlantic flyway, which uh, spans uh, two hemispheres, uh, the southern and northern, and uh, is so critical for many shorebirds. They stop here for three weeks so that they can fatten up, and they need to do that to fuel their three-day journey across the Atlantic Ocean to South America. So that's a time here over this average three-week period where they're feeding on these vast mudflats behind me, and when the mudflats are covered during high tide, they're seeking out uh, beaches and other coastal spots to rest. The upper Bay of Fundy, is uh, the last big land mass stop over for them before they jump across the ocean. And in addition to being the last great wetland before they make that jump, it also happens to be a fantastic feeding spot. The mud shrimp in particular happen to be breeding at that time of year. So normally they're living quite deep in the muds, but while the times are breeding, they tend to actually come up to the surface. So that makes them far more accessible for the shorebirds and the shorebirds know that and those mud shrimp are super um, high energy they're like powered bars. Shorebirds cannot swim and they cannot eat during high tide so we get the highest tides in the world here at this stopover site and that is a challenge to the birds so we have protected over 560 acres of shoreline habitat for them but if the birds were continually disturbed during high tide they wouldn't uh, have the energy reserves they need in order to survive their over ocean flight. And our presence here during the shorebird migration allows us to raise awareness for the bird sensitivities and reduce human disturbance to them while they're here. The Bay of Fundy is a critical migratory stopover, but it's just a three week stop for each of these birds. So there are many other places in their migration range that are important to their survival. By networking with people 
in the Bay of Fundy and throughout the Western Hemisphere were able to better protect these birds uh, throughout their range. So in 1986 in Delaware Bay, the Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network began. In 1987, Shepity Bay, here uh, where we are today, um, became the second site, followed by Minus Basin the following year. 20, 30 years ago, people were somewhat aware of the Minus Basin internationally, but increasingly, through various designations that the site has received, um, it's become one that's recognized worldwide. So in the late 80s, the Ramsar Convention, which recognizes wetlands of international importance, designated the Southern Bight as a Ramsar site. And that was the first step in sort of this area gaining international recognition. The Midas Basin, or the Upper Bay of Fundy, in the context of shorebirds, is known to be one of the major important stopover spots around the planet for shorebirds. So that's why it's part of that network. In 2004, I believe, the province, in conjunction with uh, the Nova Scotia Nature Trust, actually, down in Halifax, developed a shorebird uh, conservation project for the Minas Basin and it was called the Fundy Shorebird Project. It ran for three years and the main objective of that project was to bring public awareness and try to affect or encourage local people to become stewards for the areas that the shorebirds required while they were here. So we're looking at trying to protect resting habitat basically, areas where bird shorebirds rested during their feeding cycle here. We developed a, a, a list of best practices, conservation practices for the shorebirds, and basically asked the landowners to observe those practices while they were using their land and managing their properties. But also, they were agents for us in a way, and they would be extending that those practices to people that they saw on the beach and encouraging them, for instance, to keep their dogs on a leash or to not walk on the beach during high tide when the birds are resting on the coastline. It's all about people. The shorebirds are doing their thing irrespective of what we do. What's happened over time is that people are using the beach much more and they're expanding their use of the beaches and we really don't have a handle on how much people are using the beaches and what sorts of things they're doing. This is how our Space to Roost project has come about and it's a partnership with Bird Studies Canada, Dalhousie University and the province of Nova Scotia and the Blomidon Naturalist Society and Canadian Wildlife Service and it's been really exciting to work with these partners to think about uh, these key spaces in the Minas Basin of the Bay of Fundy, um, these key roosting sites and how we can find shared space solutions with the recreational users. So that's what we've been working on for the past three years. We had four sites here in the Minas Basin where we did site audits to assess the number of shorebirds in the area, the number of recreational users, and the type of recreational users. So people walking, walking their dogs, fishing, swimming, anything you can think of that people want to be doing in the summer in Nova Scotia. And we talked to a lot of different people to figure out why they were using the beaches and if they knew the importance of the site to shorebirds. So in 2017, we put in signs here at the access to the Guzzlin and Davenport, and then on either side of what we deemed shorebird resting beaches, just asking people to avoid the beach on a voluntary basis from two hours before to two hours after high tide in August, and we were overwhelmed with the positive response. People really were interested in saving the space for shorebirds. We had far fewer shorebirds disturbed. Um, by human recreational users in 2017 than in 2016. So that was a great result. We're encouraged by that, but it will take work over time and uh, continued presence and encouragement as well and engagement of some of the local businesses too, who can play a really key role in helping share the message um, with visitors and with residents alike. It's looking like with the positive um, feedback we're getting from funders and others that perhaps we'll be able to extend it into the future, which would be a fantastic result for our migratory shorebirds. The shorebird populations that come into the Bay of Fundy are very segregated between the four different arms of the bay. Recent advances in science uh, tell us that the shorebirds that utilize Cumberland Basin near Amherst, Nova Scotia and Cobequid Bay near Truro, Nova Scotia need the resources there in order to survive as well. 
So we are currently working to expand the existing boundary of the Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network to include these two additional areas. There's a number of issues facing uh, semi-palmated sandpipers, including uh, hunting on the wintering grounds, uh, disturbances during uh, their times when they're on our shores, like here on the Bay of Fundy, and uh, also climate change, which is a really big unknown. This is a species that relies a lot on coastal habitats, and we know the coasts are going to be really vulnerable to climate change impacts. So uh, that's something that uh, we're going to need to really keep an eye on and understand and, and work with communities to ensure that our coasts are, um, are shared uh, with, with species like semi-palmated sandpipers.